Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting of the Health and Human Services Committee to order. It is Friday, March 15th, 2024. And we do have a quorum present. Um, Senator Kupek and Senator Abler are online, and we are expecting other members um, shortly. So uh, we will begin today with Senate File 716. Uh, Senator Champion, welcome to the committee. And please proceed. Would you um, let me know if you'd like to move your author's amendment first before we get going, or? Madam Chair, that would be wonderful because the uh, the DE or the DE1 puts the bill in the shape that we would like and it's minor changes, so uh, I, I will have a time uh, during my presentation to, to articulate what those small changes are, but we'd love for the DE1 to be amended okay. onto the bill. Thank you. So um, Senator Hoffman moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any opposed? Uh, the motion does prevail. The A1 is adopted. Thank you. So, um, Senator Champion, please proceed. So, let me start by saying thank you to you, uh, Madam Chair, as well as the committee for the opportunity to talk about uh, the Minnesota African American Family Preservation Act. I think it's important for us to put in context that the purpose of this bill is to keep African American families in Minnesota intact when they encounter child protection services. The bill, as you will see through our presentation, intends to address disparities that African-American families face in the child welfare system. Uh, we believe that it's always important to address any challenges with responsible policy. And so we, we hope that this uh, committee will move this bill forward. Uh, the, uh, first thing that is important to note about this bill is that it establishes this act and it provides for child protection out of home placement and termination of parental rights processes specific to African American families and disproportionately represented children and families. For example, it prohibits a court from terminating parental rights solely because the parent fails to complete a case plan. This bill also requires case reviews, creates the um, African American Child Welfare Oversight Council that requires DHS to establish um, the African American Child Wellbeing Unit, and it establishes grants to provide services and, and support for African Americans and disproportionately represented children and families involved in Minnesota's child welfare system. Lastly, um, the bill modifies procedure for the petition for, for the reestablishment of legal and child relationships. Um, that was a bill that I had passed uh, a couple years ago uh, that required the termination of parental rights to be at least 48 months before a parent who, um, whose rights were terminated for an act that was, was not egregious uh, could, re could petition the court for um, reestablishment of parental rights after 48 months. We believe it should be shorter. That is what this bill calls for that to be looked at as well. But this bill also ensures the frequent visitation for African Americans and disproportionately represented children in out of home placement. And it requires a cultural competency for people working in child welfare systems and a, a, an appropriate uns unspecified amount of money to administer the act. One of the things that you're going to hear about is that unfortunately uh, African-American children are disproportionately uh, uh, taken from their families in, in our, our system. And what I like to underscore is that not only is the, uh, the parents' parental rights are terminated, but the system uh, allows for that child to be separated from his whole entire family. That means grandma, aunts, uncles, siblings, and this bill attempts to, first of all, make the counties and others slow down, take a real hard, active look at what you're doing, and really make sure that you're doing everything possible to keep these families together. Because under 260C, reunification is what is supposed to happen, but it doesn't happen when you think in terms of African-American children. The last thing that I'd like to note is, is that there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the standard around the term active efforts, which is used just so that you know in Indian Child Welfare Act as well. Uh, it requires local agencies seeking to place an Indian child, if we're looking at ICWA, an Indian child out of, 
out of home to prove to the court that they made efforts to provide remedial services and rehabilitative programs to prevent the breakup of the Indian family and that those efforts failed. Reasonable, reasonable efforts are not federally defined and are generally understood to mean less involvement. This bill and the, the amendment says, hey, you have to demonstrate and show that you've made active efforts from the beginning, throughout the process, and at the end in order to make sure you've done everything possible in order for African American children to remain unified with their family. And so uh, 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 the amendment also expands to disproportionately uh, 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 challenge families as well. So it's not just African Americans, because we do believe that when you think about the other disproportionately affected families, those are families of color as well. So with that being said, uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I, I, I believe that it's constitutional. I know there's been a lot of arguments about the constitutionality of it. It is constitutional because now with the amendment, no one can just say that it pertains only to uh, African-American children, although they are the primary, uh, as, as well as other children of color. So um, with that being said, we have a very limited amount of time, and we're going to start with Khalees Houston, who is the executive director of Village Arms. And if the, and if the uh, chair so allows after uh, Khalees Houston's uh, comments. We will then go to the Council of Minnesota's of African Heritage, Theo Rose, in person. So with that being said, uh, Madam Chair, I hope that we will now invite Khalees Houston. Welcome. Welcome to the committee. And Thank you. Uh, Ms. Houston, please uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Absolutely. Khalees Houston, Executive Director of Village Arms, Chair of the NAACP's Child Protection Committee. Um, we aren't before you with a new issue here, a decade, we're before you with a, a decades old matter that year after year worsens each time this body fails to act, the disparities increase for our families. And I want to make it clear as we go through our presentation that we are not discussing abusive families. We're talking about non-abusive families that need services and supports from family and community, not a government agency. So I just want to make that clear. The majority of our families are not involved um, for child involved in child protection for allegations of actual abuse. Um, and this bill would not protect those that are actually abusing their children. So I want to make that clear. Uh, for years, the state of Minnesota, decades actually, the state of Minnesota has discriminated on the basis of race against black families, uh, particularly in Hennepin County and Ramsey County, but it is a statewide issue. And this discrimination is evident in the historic, pervasive, and ongoing overrepresentation of black families in the child welfare system. Systemic racism exists at every decision point of the child protection process. Um, African American children, we make up less than 10% of the total child population, but we're 32% of those that are displaced each year. According to DHS's data, we're coming into the system for less serious allegations, but our children remain two to seven times more likely to be removed from home. So white families coming in for the same or a more egregious allegation are allowed to get in-home services and supports and services to keep their children and their family intact. I did provide the committee members with a PowerPoint. I won't go through this whole thing for the sake of time, but I just want to note some of the disparities for you all. We're three times more likely to be reported to child protection. Once the call comes in, if the family is of African descent, they're 2.4 to 4.7 times more likely to screen that call in. Our, again, our children are two to seven times more likely to be removed, and the longer our children remain in care, the longer they experience, the more they experience multiple moves in placement settings. So foster home to foster home before just aging out of the system without permanency, meaning they're never adopted or reunified with their families. Several components influence this, including and starting with our mandated reporters over-reporting our families. But then also, once the, the call comes in, CPS is assigning our families to the family investigation track at higher rates and for less serious allegations. This type of bias continues throughout the life of the case. The majority of the families that face a termination of parental rights at the, the, the end of their case are African-American families. And again, we're coming into the system for less serious allegations. 
why are we having the most punitive and harsh outcomes once that case ends? This bill is asking the county to slow down, to engage the family and community at the investigative stage, to employ and implement safety plans with concrete resources, services, and supports to address whatever quote unquote crisis is occurring in the home. Um, I'm going to pass it on because we only have 20 minutes. I, I'm not sure why, because again, this issue is 50, 60 years old. Uh, we've been fighting, but we'll try to get everything in in, the, in this time frame. And Madam Chair, uh, just to help here, again, we're uh, underscoring the notion that reunification should and should always be uh, the objective. And so with that, we would ask your, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I keep wanting to say your honor because I'm so used to <laughs> saying your honor, <laughs> right? Uh, Madam Chair, if we could go to Theo Rose. Thank you. Um, uh, welcome to the committee, Mr. Rose. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, um, Chair Wickland, Chair Wickland and members. My name is Theodore Rose. Um, I'm, I'm a legislative and policy director for the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. On behalf of our board and leadership, I thank you for the opportunity to comment on the African American Family Preservation Act. The Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage was created by the Minnesota legislature to advise government on, on the needs and concerns of our constituent communities. Based on state law, our constituents include persons of African descent in the state of Minnesota. That includes those who self-identify as African American or African immigrant, black American, or black immigrant, or those persons of mixed race. The African American Family Preservation Act has been among our council's top priorities since the, its original introduction several sessions ago. If the Minnesota legislature wants to effectively address the well-being needs of black children and families, then it must act urgently to combat child welfare disparities. It is impossible to overstate the level of hardship and trauma that our communities are experiencing around this issue. If the legislature wants the communities to feel that, they, that it is working for them, then lawmakers must be intentional about elim eliminating the kinds of failures that lead to overrepresentation of black children in the child protection. Passing the African American Family Preservation Act is a good first step. Our council has submitted written testimony on why we should all be outraged by the present situation and why we should channel that outrage into support for this bill. So we, we submitted that written testimony. Um, the last two things I would say is that the bill is based on good science. Uh, the emphasis on prevention aligns with the best practices for protecting the well-being of children and families. The support for this bill goes across cultural and geographic boundaries um, in our communities. The bill has organizational support from African American and African immigrant communities, including East African and West African organizations. The support also includes organizations in the Twin Cities Metro and in Greater Minnesota. So we want to thank Senator Champion and Representative Agbaje for their leadership on this bill, and we urge the, commu the committee to support the bill and ensure that it is successful in terms of its movement through the legislative uh, process this session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Champion, I have, other, I have a couple testifiers that are showing that they're on Zoom, or, and then I have some others that I are in person? Is there yes. a certain order that, or should we go to the Zoom test? So if I can say this, I want to underscore, and then I'll give you my thoughts about that. In your packets, you should have received several support letters as well. So thank you to Mr. Rose for also identifying the su su support from their state agency, but even the Association of, of Minnesota Counties also support it. But I hope that you take a look in your packets and see the other support. With that being said, uh, Madam Chair, we can go to Latasha Bacon, uh, who is on virtual for a couple minutes of testimony before we go to Declara Tripp, who is also a mother. Uh, thank you. So, um, Latasha Bacon, if you could please um, state your name for the record and then begin your testimony. Okay. I don't know. My camera's not turning on, but can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Latasha Bacon. 
Um, in 2018, I sent my children to a babysitter so I could work. Shortly after they returned them home, I noticed there was something wrong with my daughter, Layla. So I decided to take her to Children's Hospital, only, <clears throat> only to discover that her leg was broken. I was informed by the hospital staff that we were not allowed to leave and that Child Protective Services was coming to speak with me. Child Protective Services showed up 12 hours later and I explained to them that the kids had just come home from their sitter. I told them exactly what happened, but unfortunately they informed me that they were removing my daughter because I was the custodial parent and legally responsible for providing adequate child care. Um, five days later, we go to our first court date and they remove my son. They inform me that they, even though they are not sure when the injury occurred, I am the custodial guardian and by law I'm responsible. So our first court date was a petition to terminate my parental rights. I have no criminal record. I've never been in trouble of any kind with no previous contact with child protection. My children were placed in multiple foster homes where they were abused. I continuously reported the abuse and it was ignored. They removed my seven-year-old son from the vet lecture's home after he reported the abuse and even tried to protect his little sister from the abuse by taking her and running into the woods to hide. My infant daughter was left in the vet lecture's care alone and shortly after his removal, unfortunately on August 26th of 2018, I was informed that my 18-month-old daughter, Layla Jackson, was in the ICU with no brain activity, only to learn her death was the result of child abuse. To add insult to injury, Jason Betledge, the foster father who was, not, who was not properly screened to be a foster parent, is witnessed in video screaming white pride at my daughter, but that is still not being considered a hate crime. His wife ignored the abuse, even going as far as talking to her family about how she hoped that she wouldn't lose her child because he was being abusive to the foster child. Even with the thought of losing her own child, Mrs. Betledge did nothing to report the abuse and wasn't charged with a crime even after Layla's death. Layla was born at 24 weeks on March 20th of 2017. She weighed one pound, eight ounces, and she fought very hard for her life, spending nearly half of her life in the hospital, just to be cheated out of it, just to be cheated out of her life too soon. Needless to say, if there was provisions put in place like the African American Family Preservation Act, maybe my daughter would still be alive today. Thank you, Ms. Bacon. Thank you for sharing, and I, I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, uh, now we have, um, I'm sorry. Declare it, Tripp. Declare uh, Tripp. Uh, Madam Chair. Ms. Tripp, if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes. <clears throat> Greetings, everyone. My name is Declare Tripp. My name is Declare Tripp, and I'm sorry. I get very emotional after hearing her story because it relates to my story. Um, I would like to briefly share and speak to a live experience as I too um, had experience with Children's Hospital as well. Um, I believe my experience speaks volumes to the need of this act. In 2015, my son suffered from a medical condition as a result of being premature. Following a doctor's visit, I was reported to Child Protection. The agency found no evidence of abuse against him or my other three children, yet they removed him from my care. My home was assessed and found to be safe and stable to the standards that my other children remained in the home with me. Multiple family members fought to be considered as foster parents for my son, but were all ignored by the agency. As a result, my son was placed in several different stranger foster homes where he suffered significant abuse and neglect. My son was denied care from the agency, delaying medical procedures, causing him to be diagnosed with failure to thrive and almost losing him in the care of the county. This, in my opinion, was a disservice rather than a service provided to my son by the county. I exercised and educated myself on the laws, the statutes, procedures, as well as attempting to utilize the existing laws, ombudspersons for African Americans that are in place to protect my son's rights, and it was to no prevail. Throughout the process, I was forced to take multiple psych evaluations at the, as the county suggested that my continuous fight for the return of my son was an indication of my mental illness. 
African American workers that were not aligned with the county's positions were retaliated against and removed from my case throughout the process. I was forced to represent myself pro se. Um, I was successful at two different TPRs and trial while at the same time suffering a life threatening event of my own where I was given 10% chance of survival, survival, excuse me, prior to the abruptly return of my son to my care after fighting for four years. These unjustifiable acts were against the state's existing laws to protect our children. I believe that this act, the Family, African American Family Preservation Act, is the act that is needed to preserve the African American families that are being directly impacted today. Thank you. Thank you very much for and sharing. Ma Senator and Champion. And Madam Chair, before we go to our other uh, testifiers, I think this is a good place for the committee to also look at, if you look at the DE that has been adopted, if you look at page two, line 2.4 and 2.5, what we're saying is, is that it is important for the department to provide active efforts to preserve an African American or disproportionately represented child's family. If you also look at what has been um, identified on page five, which is in, in section four, which talks about the duty to prevent out-of-home placement and promote family reunification. Uh, the the, the uh, previous testifier, clearly, if you look at lines one, excuse me, 5.11 to 5.15, says a responsible social service agency shall make active efforts to prevent the out-of-home placement of an African-American or disproportionately represented child, eliminate the needs for a child's removal from the child's home, and reunify an African-American or disproportionately represented child with the child's family as soon as practicable. One of the things that Ms. Houston talked about, we recognize that there is some things that families uh, will go through if, it's, um, if there's abuse or alleged abuse or alleged other things, but we uh, don't think that this, this body or any other body should always just conclude that, uh, that when a, a, an, an African-American family faces the child protection, that is for abuse. And, and she's talked about, Ms. Houston identified the, um, uh, uh, the differences in treatment. So with that being said, Madam uh, Chair, we ask for Cynthia Wilson, who's with the NAACP. She's the president. She's on virtual, followed by Rhea uh, Bornman Spears, who's with Child Protection and a family law attorney. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Wilson. Um, if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, my name is Cynthia Wilson. I am uh, the president of the Minneapolis NAACP. Um, here wearing a, a few hats. I'm also a business owner and I'm also a um, licensed uh, foster parent. Um, my testimony is actually coming from a couple of places. One, as a foster parent and, and then also as um, someone who experienced um, placement. Um, my nieces and nephew, my, my sister had uh, some mental health issues and my uh, nieces and nephews um, were taken from her home and they were going to be uh, placed two by two and she had eight children. Uh, my mother already had children in the home and so in Michigan, they can't have a certain amount of children in the home. Uh, at any case, my mother and my aunt was able to um, get my nieces and nephews in placement and raise them um, until um, they were young adults. Um, but by the grace of God, uh, that placement not only saved my nieces and nephews' lives, and were, they were able to live with relatives, um, but every one of them are college graduates to this day. And I know that wouldn't have been able to be the case had they been separated and, and placed in, in various other homes. I start that with my intro because the importance around this act is paramount. I mean, I can't even stress it enough. And I'm getting a little choked up just thinking about the other cases that have gone before me. Um, but most importantly, I, I just, I, I, 
I struggle to understand or wrap my head around why this act has not been passed or enforced. I, I, I just, I cannot figure that out. Um, then I think about how um, eloquently those testimonies who went before us have stated fact after fact of what this act does, how we're still, as Khalees has said, we're still decades behind. And the longer we wait to pursue any action, we're, we're displacing children one day at a time. And what are we waiting for the next child to be murdered, the next child to be killed? What, 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 what are we waiting for is what I'm asking. This is a, a, a national, it's a state and national, um, has got state and national attention uh, from our NAACP offices, which is why um, our national president has approved us to file uh, charges against Hennepin County for their dereliction in, in this act. Um, we're tired of what we've been seeing. Um, what 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 I, I don't understand if this committee is aware of or not. We are villagers, and I probably created that name, but it takes a village to raise a child. And before I was a, a licensed uh, foster parent, I was just a villager. I was someone who took care of the children in the neighborhood. You come to my house, you made sure you got food. You came to my house, you were going to get cared for. That's just how it's been. And in the black culture, that's what we've done. If historically, if you go down the line, we have been there to care for each other. What this act does, I believe, is it puts that back in process. What was taken from us, this act puts that back in process. And so I'm just requesting and asking the chair to do their jobs. Do what you were sworn in to do. Um, and, and, and pass this act, move this act forward for the lives of our children who are our now and our future generation. And it, it's really on a heavy heart that I have this morning because we are your constituency and we're asking you to listen to what we're saying. Listen to what we're saying, have compassion about our children. African-American children are dying. African-American children are being displaced. African-American children are not being intentionally uh, replaced in their homes, which is what is supposed to be happening. When you take these children out, they're supposed to be rejoined to their families after whatever and they need to have happened to, so that they can be replaced. But what's happening is that we're checking every box, but we're still not being able to get the kids back in the homes. So we're asking, please, that you take a strong look at this. Stop playing checkers and chess behind the closed doors, coming in, 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 in the front line and saying that, whoa, 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 we really believe in this and we want to help the African-American children and black children matter. But behind the doors, you're playing check it, checkers and chess with the lives of our babies. And we're asking that it stops and you take a strong look at this and pass this act on behalf of our African-American children. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, and now, is it uh, Ms. Bornman Spears? Yes. If you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rhea Bornman Spears. I'm an attorney in the Twin Cities and I've been practicing in the area of child protection reform activism, taking cases that are the cases that you're hearing about today for the last 10 plus years. So one of the things that Ms. Houston was modest about and didn't bring up was the fact that this bill includes a lot of oversight and a pilot project already went through Hennepin County. That pilot project proved that this bill is necessary and would make a difference. So the pilot project, you can ask Ms. Houston more about the data from that, but it worked. And a big part of that pilot process was that the social workers that were part of Ms. Vi Ms. Uh, Khalees Houston's Village Arms Agency built relationships with the social workers within Hennepin County. Through that process, it was revealed even more boldly than we could 
probably shock you with this morning about how much biased activity goes on behind the scenes and how much the African American families are targeted and affected by those biased practices. We found information about social workers being told to change notes to affect families in adverse ways. We found out about them being pressured to the point that they felt they were violating their own ethics and the moral code of a social worker that they take to do no harm. We found that they were actually having their jobs threatened or leaving their jobs in order to avoid making an adverse action to the certain African American families that they were assigned to. And this happened, there's at least six social workers that we know of that are willing to talk about that. I've got a transcript from a trial we just completed where that was put on the record and uh, not disputed by the county. We have emails to show that that was going on. You've heard um, the president of NAACP talking about a lawsuit. Impact litigation is another way, of course, to resolve these issues, but the bill would be a much more amicable way because, of course, that would cost the counties and the taxpayers a lot less money. Mr. Champion referenced it, and I want to make sure you've heard it because Ms. Tripp also brought it up in relation to her own case. There are statutes and rules that should protect these families and should prevent what's going on, but they're not followed. There's also a lot of discretion within a lot of those. Ms. Houston made the point about the fact that this bill isn't about the families where abuse has occurred. Neglect is a term that can be interpreted by each individual social worker. And so if there's an expectation from management within the different counties or implicit bias, there could also be, you know, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe sometimes they aren't aware of the biases that are happening. The pilot project was able to have regular conversations and consults. That's a big part of what happens with the oversight, is there's constant community involvement, constant conversation that helps these workers to see a different way of managing the families. They reduced removals with the pilot project. They uh, uh, proved to the county that there was relative support that existed that wanted to come forward. A lot of the cases I have taken over the years and pro bono have been for relatives fighting against the county to be able to adopt their own relative children. I have repeatedly had to fight with the county even if an African American family member was foster care licensed by the state of Minnesota, they have been denied the right to raise their own relative child while the child, is, child or children have still been uh, placed and adopted at the count with the county's blessing, of course, by non-relative white families. And that is all kinds of long-term effects, and we have tons of research to show that we shouldn't be doing that, and we still are. Thank you for your testimony. And, Senator Chair. And Madam Chair, I, I recognize that time is of the essence, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate the uh, time to talk. Uh, uh, before this body, there's th three provisions that I want to just turn your attention to so that when you look at it and consider it, uh, moving it on, it's there. Number one, if you look at page eight, uh, section six, lines 8.5 to 8.9, where it talks about, so no one can think that we're trying to do anything other than protect children. It says, nothing in this section shall be construed to prevent the emergency removal of an African American or disproportionately represented child's parent or custodian or the emergency placement of the child in a foster setting in order to prevent imminent physical damage or harm to a child. We recognize that, we put that here, and the only other change that, uh, from the original language to the DE is that we expanded on the emergency removal language in order to make sure that we are all very clear and definitive about that. The other uh, uh, notion I want you to consider is page number six. When you look at non-custodial parents, temporary out-of-home placement, um, we think it's important for the responsible social service agency make active efforts to identify and locate the child's non-custodial or non-adjudicated parent and the child's relatives to notify the child's parents and relatives that the child is or will be placed in foster care and provide the child's parents and relatives with a list of legal resources. And that notice also allows for that uh, uh, non-custodial parent and family to step forward in order to care for that child because we believe that to be important. And last but certainly not least, if you look at page 11, section 8, 
Um, if you look at uh, the accountability notion that, that I last testified was uh, highlighting, um, that is addressed in the bill. If you look at line 11.14 to, 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 and, and then it goes on, but I'm going to read the beginning of, of, of what's at 11.14, a responsible social service agency employee who has, the, uh, has duties related to child protection shall not knowingly do any of the things like make untrue uh, statements or intentionally withhold information that may be material to a case, fabricate or falsify any documents or any actions that shall uh, constitute grounds for adverse employment action because we think there needs to be that accountability on both sides of the equation. So with that, um, um, I, uh, th that's the end of our testifiers, but yeah, I think I just, Ms. Houston has w one additional thing to say. Yes, Ms. absolutely. Houston? I just really want to quickly say that we did pilot the bill, the African American Family Preservation Act in Hennepin County over a three-year period. We served over 200 families. We closed over 90% of those cases without a child <laughs> removal, and that was by safety planning at the beginning with family and community. We connected them to resources. We walked them through whatever licensing processes they needed, and we took our time to slow down and humanize those families. Families. Again, we are not asking you to protect uh, abusive parents, uh, but those that uh, essentially just need some extra supports and services. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll, I'll point out for members just to make sure people see that there is a uh, one uh, handout from Hennepin County that describes the pilot. Mm -hmm. And so there's more detail about that on that handout. So, um, so members, um, do you have questions or comments? Um, um, I'm sorry. Oh, I have one more testifier signed up. Um, Cindy Devon, Devonish, is she here? She wasn't on our list. I don't know if she's Did, here. Oh, she is here. If she, I guess she signed up to testify, so if you... And as she's coming, uh, Madam Chair, I did I indicate to the, to the committee that I would also highlight if there was another ch uh, change from the original bill to the DE, and that would be on page 23, uh, where we added child welfare compliance and feedback portal in order to make sure that there's transparency and there's information, and that would be on page 23, section 17. And we have the testifier, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee. Ms. Devonish, please state, state your name for the record and begin. Cindy Devonish. And please, please proceed. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Cindy Devonish, and I stand in full solidarity to testify regarding SF0716, the African American Preservation Act. I am one of the directors of the DFL Feminist Caucus. I serve in the community in various capacities, including a person with lived experiences with um, child protection and guardian ad litem as a young mother and as a youth. I am proud to say I've used my lived experiences to speak for those who continue to be impacted by the child welfare system, which includes my full-time employment at Hennepin County as a child protection social worker. I am a proud member of the NAACP and former chair of the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights. Um, the, recently, the DFL Feminist Caucus passed a resolution that strongly supports the African American Preservation Act. Um, the DFL Feminist Caucus continues to support, advocate, and promote the health, safety, and human rights improved social, economic, political conditions of all people in their lives and communities by eliminating sexism through the principles of the caucus. While there has been much progress uh, made in eliminating racial disparities, there remains a large, uh, a long road ahead uh, to a society free of and just and discrimination. One of the most shocking disparities in Minnesota is um, the outcomes of African-American children in this state regarding child protection. Not only are African-Americans families more likely to be the subject of child protection investigations, but they're more likely to be separated um, during the process. This is unequal treatment that comes at a high cost to our community as a whole. Um, as a proud member of this community, including the DFL Feminist Caucus, NAACP, former uh, chair of the Minneapolis Commission on Civil Rights, again, it is important that we no longer ignore 
the data that has been presented we know, is important that we no longer ignore the testimony of people with lived experiences and the trauma that continues to uh, impact our community. Um, I'm going to speak quite frankly and risk uh, the loss of my, what may be my employment. As a current Hampton County employee, I have been removed from a current child protection uh, case because I speak against um, the um, TPR, termination of parental rights, on a family member that has been very active in his case plan. And because I disagreed with the termination of parental rights, I've been removed from the case and a new caseworker has been appointed. Even though he's following statute 260 of the DHS, which states that we have a duty to ensure that our fathers have a right to parent their child. And this father is being denied of that right and removing me from the case plan because I'm against termination of parental rights. And I've recently reported these devious actions. This act, the African American Preservation Act, I'm sorry, is, is beyond, is not just words on a piece of paper. It is what is needed in our community. And if you're for your constituents, you will help pass this vote. And I implore you to help pass the African American Family Preservation Act. Thank you. I want to add, Cindy is not Thank the you, only Houston. social worker. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I just need to acknowledge oh, okay. before sorry. you. Ms. Houston, go ahead. Now. Oh, okay. Uh, Cindy Devonish is not the only social worker that's been forced to make allegations against families or substantiate abuse when there was no evidence of abuse. During the pilot, we were actually cut short in 2023, the month of March. We were supposed to continue the pilot until December, but because we advocated too strongly for a case, they stopped giving us new cases. There was a young African-American couple that was reported to child protection by their daycare because one of the children had a mark on his face. The family was investigated by a social worker. The first investigator, a white investigator, found no evidence of abuse and was prepared to close the case. The mother reached out to us. We added the case to the pilot. The second investigator investigated the family and found no evidence of abuse. The supervisor of that investigator forced her, told her if she did not make a, 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 a maltreatment finding against the family and sign the petition to take the family to court, that she would lose her job. They took, sent her to, e, to HR. They sent her to the union. The union told her, just comply with whatever they're telling you to do. If you run into the family in the streets, just pray for them and apologize. I cannot make this up. Ben to Barry told, it's all, we have the transcripts for this now because we're still fighting the maltreatment finding on for this family. She quit her job rather than to make this maltreatment finding against this family. So the supervisor of that social worker signed the 14-page petition that was full of fluff took the family to court, the judge saw right through it, and thankfully, because of the help of the NAACP, the case was thrown out that day. Rhea Borman Spears is the attorney on that case. We're still in court now fighting the maltreatment finding that was still made against this family. Everyone that investigated or had any contact with this family said this is a great family, even the daycare that reported them. They don't physically discipline their children at all. They use yoga and meditation. I don't know anyone that does that with children that are under the age of 10 years old. It was a result of the father on that case being a foster child himself and vowing that he would never physically discipline his children. But because of the color of their skin, they were still wrapped up in that system. You just heard Cindy say that she was told that she would be taken off of her case if she didn't agree with the termination of parental rights against a father. Tanya Lofton was the caseworker on declaratory Tripp's case who wanted to return the child and close the case and she was gagged and taken off of the case as well. So this is an ongoing matter. We have another social worker who was demoted because she wouldn't remove a child from its grandmother, from its black 
grandmother. There is corruption within the child protection system, not only in Hennepin County, but across the state. You cannot look at this data and really believe that thousands upon thousands of black families are actually abusing their children. Listen to what we are saying. The Council on Minnesotans of African Heritage started 40 plus years ago as a result of this issue. And I know I'm over time, but we deserve more than 20 minutes because it is our families' lives on the line here. So thank you. This is the most thank important you. bill that you will hear. I guarantee that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would like to go have a chance for members to ask questions. And um, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, you know, as you're looking at this, it, it takes me back like nine years when Irina Moran and I were beginning to take testimony on this. And um, with that, I wanted to just to let Senator Champion know there was a, um, an artist, there was a, a band that wrote a song called I Am Grateful. I don't know if you remember who that band is, uh, Senator Champion, um, but that is something today. And I'm, I'm grateful because what you're doing here is you're opening the door. Um, opening the door that occurred that allowed what I see I see this not as a, as a, all right, we're going to do something now, but rather this is opening a door. Miss Tripp uh, brought up her uh, incident with the, the system, and the system failed Miss Tripp. And, and it reminds me this, because of the fact her child had a medical condition, Senator Champion, it's a person with a disability, right? Mm -hmm. um, the system is disproportionately uh, goes against folks like Miss Tripp. And it was to the point where, if, if I can, Madam Chair, U.S. Department of Justice um, and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services stated that the child welfare discrimination, child welfare discrimination policies uh, toward parents with disabilities are longstanding and widespread. The National Council on Disabilities said the President and the U.S. Congress on, on this matter described the child welfare system as biased toward parents of kids with disabilities. Ms. Tripp, um, system encounter would not be fixed with your bill because you don't have in there disproportionately represented child, a child with a disability in there. It's a simple oral there, Mr. And Senator Champion. And because when you look at it, the parents of, of um, children with disabilities make 9% uh, nine you know, of the nation, yet 20% of all foster youth are kids with disabilities. Now this is another one, the intersectionality conversation in there the majority of those are kids of color. And so you've now just ratcheted it up. So I'm glad this bill's coming because it's gonna absolutely open the door to be able to say the system needs to be looked at. There was a book that was done um, many, many years ago um, in, in that book Dorothy Roberts wrote about the child welfare system really needing to take a look at because of the historical way that it was set up. And so I appreciate um, Senator Champion bringing this this bill forward and and you know, there's you know, there's no one like you on this one That was another song. I think you guys did on that one, too So um, madam chair, I let, I, what's the next stop for this because this really needs to go um, and if Senator Champion would take the consideration of adding disability in section um, 3.17 subdivision 10 somewhere after a comma whether uh, that would also then add into that intersectionality conversation so and he can either do it now or do it later. I'm, I'm, I just know he'll do it. Senator Champion. Th thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hoffman, for your uh, words and for your insightfulness. Uh, we think the language includes those with disabilities when you look at active efforts, but we'll certainly chat with you about that and see and just make sure that we are... <laughs> Uh, uh, we have the right language that is inclusive because we do say or disproportionately represented child's family. So that would include disabilities. Uh, 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 young people with disabilities as well. M Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair, and thank you for that. Yeah, you do that. But when the people are reading the statute and they're, and they're making the decisions, for example, mm -hmm. If, if the system would have known that the child that Miss Tripp had had a medical condition and it would have been in their brain that, that, oh, maybe something else is here, they wouldn't have gone so fast down another rabbit hole. And unless you specifically put in statute, and what you do if subdivision 10 
starting at 3.17, disproportionately represented child, go to 3.18, means a child, and then you spell out whose race, culture, ethnicity, and low-income socioeconomic status. Disability and low-income, disability and unemployment, they all go hand in hand. In this case, for example, Hennepin County, Hennepin County Medical Center wanted to do a discussion on equity and they refused to talk about intersectionality when they didn't realize that 30% of people that of race have a disability that are at HCMC and it's just like we got to have that piece in there and I'm just saying and if unless you uh, delineate it out um, Mr. Lawyer uh, you know that someone's going to go well I don't see it in there I think that needs to be in there just so it just tells the system oh by the way we are including so Miss Tripp's child is never ever runs into that example, or somebody like Miss Tripp's child never runs into that example again. Does that make sense? At, uh, um, Senator Madam Champion. Chair and Senator Hoffman, uh, we will certainly chat with you about that. We will make that commitment to have that conversation so that uh, all the language lines up, because we don't want Miss Tripp's child or situations that would involve Miss Tripp's child to um, be a problem. So what's the disposition of this, Madam Chair? Um, it needs to move to the Judiciary Committee, so we will finish our discussion and then we can proceed. So, Madam Chair, then may I ask, would Senator Champion, Mr. Senator Champion, would you be willing to add it in Judiciary or should I just go ahead and make a motion to do an oral amendment here? Uh, Senator Madam Champion. Chair, Senator Hoffman, we can have a, a, a talk about that just to make sure that the language in other places is right as well, right? Because there's more than one place that we'd have to make that consideration around. You have our commitment for us to have that conversation. That's all I needed to hear. Thank you, Madam right. Chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Abler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, good. And uh, I wish I could be there in person for this uh, this compelling bill. We heard this a different version of this uh, a couple of years ago when uh, Senator Hayden was carrying it and we sent it off to to wherever it was going to go. And I'm, I, I'm, I've listened to, I had a few minutes here to listen to a lot of the testimony and it's compelling and it's, uh, I don't think we can wait on this anymore. There's, this has been a, you know, the work groups that I've had in the past and Senator Mitchell's and you know, we keep chasing the same topics around and around. We're going to hire a consultant to look at everything and um, so Senator Champion and to the people from the NAACP and all that, I, I think it's time to do something really soon. And uh, Senator Whitcomb, I don't know what our plans are for the omnibus policy bill, uh, what you're planning to stick in there, but um, we've sent a lot of bills off to the judiciary that are going to never see the light of day in that committee. Uh, and so it would be interesting to me uh, to actually try to do something more than talk about doing something. Uh, in our own committee, and so, Senator Champion, maybe I can work with you uh, to see what elements of this are really only the subject of our committee, um, and that we could even uh, put onto the omnibus that we're going to do whenever that policy omnibus comes, which I'd be happy to offer all the elements we can possibly do, and then see if we can get this to actually move along. The the um, the stories and the horrors described by the testifiers are simply wrong and should never happen in the first place and never happen certainly again to anybody with uh, stories about, um, you know, workers being coerced and children, you know, passing and, and being harmed and leaving their families unnecessarily. So, uh, Senator Champion, uh, what do you think of that? Senator Champion. Madam Chair and uh, Senator Abler, thank you so much for that offer. We'll certainly take you up on that offer because we want to do everything we can and put it in as many places in order to get it all across the finish line. That's our intent because we share the urgency of the matter and we've been doing it and going round and around and talking about it for a while. But now is the moment, now is the time, even though I felt it was the moment some time ago. I can only deal with where we are right now and we should be going forward together. So thank you for that and thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, so Senator Champion, Madam Chair, I'm just about done, but I, I wish I were there, but I'm not. I gotta do my day job here, but um, so let's talk about that and uh, hopefully the committee will be amenable to that. So th thank you and thank you all the testifiers and my, uh, my heart goes out to you and uh, God bless. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Abrams. And, Thank you, and uh, Madam Senator Chair, Champion. Uh, just so that folks know, the other co-authors include Senator Abler, but also Senator uh, uh, Kunish, uh, Senator Murphy, and Senator May Quaid. So thank you. 
And that's only because in the, uh, just so those who don't know, uh, because in the Senate, you only can have a total of five authors. You can't be like the House and have 35 authors. So thank you. Thank you. Um, any other members have any uh, questions or, or comments? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, um, Senator Champion, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I'm alarmed to learn that there's not a hearing scheduled in the House. Is that correct? Senator Champion. Uh, sen uh, 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 Madam Chair, Senator Morrison, that is correct. But I did talk to the House author who says that they're pushing to get a hearing. So that's why it's really important on our side so that we can meet deadline and we're going to continue to push over on the other side. So uh, Representative Abaje is, is, is having or continuing to have conversation with Representative Pinto. So if there's anyone who knows uh, Representative Pinto, we can all, uh, you know, make a phone call to, uh, to Representative Pinto. Senator Morrison. Th thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Champion, for that. So I guess I, that I would echo um, Senator Abler's idea that we put at some or all of this into our omnibus bill so that we have a negotiation stance at the end of session. You know, I first heard this bill, I believe, in 2019 when the great Rena Moran brought it when I was serving in the other body. Ms. Houston was there as well. Um, and it breaks my heart to think that five years have passed since then, and I'm thinking about the children and the families. Um, this is urgent. Um, we need to move on it. Uh, and I just, I mostly just want to thank the testifiers for being here and sharing their stories. It is painful to be vulnerable in public like this, and you shouldn't have to be. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Senator. Let's get this done. Senator Champion. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Morrison, for your words. Um, and, and again, you will hear me say things not just for you all, but for the public as well, because they're learning the process, that uh, I want them to understand that, that uh, certain committees only have jurisdiction over certain things. So you can't take something from judiciary and put it in, our, uh, in this bill. So we have to get as much here and as much there. But if we pass it here and go to judiciary and we can have it in two places, we can hopefully get the support of judiciary on, on their portions of the bill as well. Thank you. So um, seeing that I don't see any other uh, requests for um, question or asking questions or commenting, um, I really appreciate all of the testifiers coming today. I appreciate um, Ms. Houston, all of the work that um, you've brought forward to us. The bill is compelling and, and we um, I really hope that we can take action. Um, you know, I, I think that, as Senator Abler said, I, I, I hope we can work together and see if there is any way that we, um, we, we can include, you know, if some of the provisions, if they have to come back to our committee. Um, so uh, appreciate your work. And uh, members, the motion would be um, Senator Hoffman would move that Senate file 716 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the committee on judiciary. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail, and Senate file 716, as amended, is passed and referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Champion. Members, we're going to move to Senator Mitchell, Senate file 4877. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, Senator Mitchell. Um, and I see there is an A1 amendment. Would you like us to adopt that as an author's amendment? Yes, please. This is my first stop, and so if everyone could please put this in the order that we want it in. Can you, if, if you, as you leave the room, if you could um, be quiet, more quiet, so that we can hear Senator Mitchell. Um, 
This would get it in the order that I wanted in, please. Thank you. Uh, Senator Morrison moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, aye. Oppo any opposed? The motion does prevail. Um, the A1 is adopted. Uh, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I would also like to thank uh, the three members of the co committee that are co-authors on this, Senator Bolden, Senator Morrison, and Senator Abler. Um, this would create a review for some of our critical incidents. Um, it establishes a multidisciplinary plenary local child mortality review team and um, it, which would be able to participate in local critical incidents reviews. It asks DHS to establish a child mortality review panel um, for those incidents related to maltreatment because the underlying goal would be that when something happens, there might be a criminal investigation or something else, but we also wanna look at this systemically and say like, where did something go wrong in the process that you know a, a child was lost in the system? Um, here's some of the needs for this. Uh, when a child passes or, or nearly dies because of suspected maltreatment, we want that review so that we can improve policies and practices going forward and learn from it. Um, this would be distinct from investigations that also in occur, um, which as I said, could be a criminal or a maltreatment investigation, um, and it allows us those opportunities for improvement. Some of the problems with the current process, it can be complex and confusing and buried in statutes. Um, our system is, is very county-based, so it can also, what those reviews can look like might look different at different counties and um, they tend to be focused more on compliance in the current system but might not do things like make recommendations um, or work with partners such as the judicial branch, law enforcement. Um, some of the reviews might have to wait for the conclusion of litigation instead of immediately kind of also starting that review process and um, doing it this way would just add to some of the transparency. Um, just to quote a Star Tribune article from November 3rd, a Star Tribune survey of more than two dozen counties shows that compliance with, um, I'm kind of paraphrasing, with the mortality review requirements is spotty. Some counties fail to re conduct the reviews, others take years to complete them. Um, and one of the DHS deputy commissioners said they could not think of a single policy or procedure that has changed as a result of the mortality reviews in the past five years. So we really wanna actually be taking that thorough look at that. And that is the purpose of the bill that I have for you today is to set up that process so that we are conducting a more thorough review and actually coming out of these tragic situations with a process for improvement. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Um, I don't have any other testifiers listed. Um, members, do you have questions or comments for Senator Mitchell? Senator Otke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Senator Mitchell, for a little clarity, um, and I'm on page 4, line 13, where it talks about the local child mortality review teams. Um, it, it talks about each county shall establish this team. Is this using current employees and just, well, mandating them to do something else or would this take additional staff? What do you envision there? Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Within this, it says that uh, the local welfare agency's child protection team can serve as that local review team. Um, it does we word, use the word may, but then also it says um, shall include but not limited to professionals with knowledge of the critical incident. So if you have the people, um, you know, it, it could be a little fluid because if you have the people within the department, and, and they are able to have that um, knowledge base and the knowledge of the incident to con conduct that, that particular review, then you could do it that way. Um, there might be a situation where 
Sometimes these cases do bound different counties or maybe there's a law enforcement component. So um, hopefully in that case, you would ask some of those other people to the table as well, whatever was needed. But within the framework, it does say that the local welfare agency could serve as that review team if that was appropriate. Senator Utke. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And again, um, would that local, I saw the reference previous to that where it said the local welfare agency's child protection, protection team. So are, do the counties all have that at this point? Um, you know, in our part of the state, our counties are low population and you know, so their staff and stuff is also uh, low in numbers. And I was just wondering, I just wanted clarity to make sure we're not having to have them add staff or where do these additional responsibilities fall? And so um, I guess if they all have a, uh, that welfare agency currently, then, then they do have those teams. But do they all have that as we speak? Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. Child welfare is run by the county, so every um, county would have a, a child protection division. Senator Aki, is that okay? Any other questions, members? Is there anyone, nobody online is asking for? Okay. Um, I don't see any more. Oh, excuse me. Um, Senator Abler, did you wish to comment or qu ask a question? I see your hand raised, but maybe that is from before. Sorry, Madam Chair, oh, I okay. uh, forgot to lower it, but I, this, it's, a good, it's a really good project. I was just trying not to talk on everything today. So um, thanks, and I appreciate you noticing me, and I'm going to become unnoticed now. All thank right. you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, Senator Mitchell, any final thoughts? Um, this bill, you know, will, um, as amended, will be referred to judi judiciary. So um, any final comments? No, I appreciate uh, the committee's time and attention to this and um, look forward to better serving the children of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it forward. Um, so the motion would be uh, Senator Bolden moves that um, Senate file 4877 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Members, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion does prevail, and Senate File 4877, as amended, is passed and referred to judiciary. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Senator Seberger. Senate File 4835. Welcome to the committee and thank you, Madam Chair. I thought I was going after Senator Champion. I do have to work at two o'clock, but all my bosses are sitting back there, so if I'm late clocking in, hey. they know why. Well, that's true. Um, um, it looks uh, like you have for Senate file forty eight thirty five uh, an A one amendment. I Is do uh, I have an A three amendment I would like to offer as oh. an author's mm -hmm. amendment. Does that replace the A1 amendment? No. Oh. Okay. Okay. That is being passed out, members. So, um, did you wish to, you, to um, does it matter which order we take these in? Senate Council? No. Okay. It doesn't matter. I can speak to the, um, the A3 amendment and, and sort of how we got to where we are. Um, to bring this bill today. This bill is the result of work that started a couple of years ago before I even got here to the Senate. The emergency medical services system in the state of Minnesota has been suffering. There are issues in greater Minnesota with regard to staffing and reimbursement and response times. There are issues in the metro with regard to response times and um, uh, pub, uh, primary service areas, reimbursement is an issue, staffing is an issue, and over the summer, Leader Diedzik at the time established an EMS task force that I co-chaired with Representative Hewitt in the other body. 
and we traveled throughout the state of Minnesota to hear from different EMS services to identify issues and hear what's going on all over the state when it comes to EMS. And coming out of that, the task force is going to issue a report, but some of the needs were so immediate that we felt that we had to act before this session was over. And those, those are the bills that are here before you today. So the first one I want to talk about has to go toward the organizational and governing structure of emergency medical service is, services in the state of Minnesota. In February of 2022, the Office of the Legislative Auditor issued a report addressing the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, the EMSRB. And what they found, and I'm reading from the, um, the initial letter here in the beginning of the report. Ms. Randall states in this report, we raise serious concerns about the regulation of ambulance services, the viability of some ambulance services, and the EMSRB's operations. Overall, EMSRB has been ineffective in its role as a system-wide leader on emergency medical issues and has failed to perform some of its basic responsibilities. We recommend that the legislature and EMSRB take action to address these and other issues. And Madam Chair, that's what I'm here to do today. The EMSRB, to its credit, did make some changes. It hired an executive director who has been outstanding in his role, but he can't do it alone. The OLA report found conflicts of interest, self-dealing, ineffective ruling, ineffective governance, and recommended in strong terms that we do something to reorganize. So that's what, we're, that's what I'm here today to talk about. My A3 amendment reorganizes the governing structure of emergency medical services in the state of Minnesota. It establishes an Office of Emergency Medical Services with a director that reports straight to the governor. It divides it into divisions of medical services, ambulance services, and labor and personnel with the appropriate advisory committees beneath them. It takes the responsibilities and duties that are currently overseen by the EMSRB and divides them into the respective divisions within this Office of Emergency Medical Services. We need some oversight when it comes to emergency medical services. We need some growth from the EMSRB the MSRB served its purpose when it existed. It's now time to change and address the shortfall, uh, short, shortfalls, problems, conflicts that the auditor found when they conducted their audit two years ago. You will see a number of EMS professionals behind me, including um, senior management in my own organization where I work that are here not necessarily in supportive of this change. But as others have noted, change is hard. And we need to do the right thing by not only our patients who expect ambulance services, but our employees, our service providers, whether they be private providers or city-based. Um, and this bill will do just that. Members, would... Um Let's adopt the A3 amendment since um, that uh, is, you know, the author is moving that. Um, Senator Bolden moves the A3 amendment. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any, aye. Opposed? Any opposed? The amendment, the A3 amendment is adopted. Thank you. And now, would you like to proceed to testifiers or do you want, I notice there is another amendment. Do you want to leave? do that now or talk about that now? Or sure, I can offer the other amendment uh, or talk about the other amendment now and that is the A1 amendment. The other piece of this puzzle is, so I just talked about the governance structure and that's something that um, stems from the OLA report and the work that's been done since then to address those issues. So that's the governance structure. Um, the system itself, there's areas in the state that are in dire need of some change. And I'm thinking of um, Greater Minnesota, uh, Senator Hanschild's district, Senator Rasmussen's district. Those are two places where we went as an EMS task force and heard the, 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 the problems, the dire problems, the, 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 the crisis really that they're in. 
So what this does is this amendment would establish um, two, we're calling them innovation zones, pilot models in uh, greater Minnesota, looking at Senator Hochschild's district, the Arrowhead in the north, up by the range, and over in the um, Elbow Lake area, Senator uh, Rasmussen's district, where the need seems to be the greatest. And those systems rely primarily on BLS services, which are EMTs, kind of a, a, a lower trained level um, of emergency medical response personnel, and the volunteer model. So when a call goes out, folks in the community have pagers. The pager goes off, that they drop what they're doing, they go down to the station, they put on their jumpsuit or whatever it is, get into the ambulance and drive to the call. That takes time. What this model will do is it will implement a full-time paramedic, which is a higher level, uh, skills, skill training level of emergency medical services provider. That person will immediately go to the call, begin providing ALS care on scene um, until the BLS ambulance gets there. If the ALS provider gets out there and decides that this isn't a, a transport or no ambulance is needed, they can cancel the ambulance. But what it does is it gets a higher level of care to the patient quicker than what we're seeing now, and it will take some of the burden off of the services that we're seeing in greater Minnesota. We're doing this as a pilot program as sort of an innovation zone for two years to gather data and see how well it works. Because we need to do something in the state of Minnesota to rethink how we deliver pre-hospital care to people here. If what we heard out in the task force hearings was that what we're doing now is not working. We have ambulance services struggling. We have um, significant staffing issues. We have reimbursement as a problem. So the task force will be issuing a report. We have additional recommendations, but we were trying to, we, we saw that the need was immediate. And we felt that uh, we, meaning me and my co-chair, that these were two things that we could do right away to start um, addressing the immediate need and um, gathering some data that will inform how we proceed in the future. So the A3 amendment establishes these uh, innovation zones, the pilot program of the Sprint Medic model um, to uh, begin that process of rethinking, reimagining, um, and making delivery of pre-hospital care in the state of Minnesota better. Members, do you have any questions about the A3 amendment? Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief question, Senator Seberger. As you talk about staffing issues, and I have heard that as well in this space, um, is there a concern around staffing the ALS paramedics to be able to go, like, is there staff for that? Or do you have concerns about that? Or how, is that, how have those conversations gone? Senator, Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Bolden. Um, We've done the homework on this. We have staff. We have agencies um, and entities ready to staff these Sprint Medic cars. They're not ambulances. They're not necessarily ambulance, ambulances. They're a squad that will go out with a paramedic with all the ALS equipment that they need um, to begin providing a higher level of care. So we don't have those concerns because we, we kind of did our homework before coming to the, to the committee here to, to ask for this um, amendment. Senator Bolin? Okay. Okay. Um, no other questions. Um, members, Senator Bolden moves the A3 amendment, or no, excuse me, the A1 amendment. Um, members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The A1 is adopted. And now um, we can move to your testifiers, uh, or you don't. Okay, there are two people who wish to testify, I should say. Um, first, I'd like to call up Michael, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, Jun Tuned, and John Fox. If you could come forward to the table. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Hey, good morning, Madam Chair and committee. I do appreciate you taking the time to hear this issue today. My name is Michael Juntanen. I am the incoming president of the Minnesota Ambulance Association. Um, and do, do want to admit openly beforehand, um, I did not get a chance to fully read the amendment that was uh, just placed in. Um, I happened to see it quickly in the hallway during session today. So. 
Um, I can't speak fully on that. So uh, I'll address what I can here. Um, when coming in here today, Senate File 4835 is something that the Minnesota Am Association strongly opposes. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the issues that, are, that we are seeing in EMS today. So we are definitely seeing a workforce and funding concern that is in dire need of some, some repair. Over the last couple of years, we've seen healthcare professionals leaving the EMS industry in droves. This is something that's not unique in healthcare or in Minnesota. It's something that we're seeing across the country. A couple of years ago in 2022, uh, it was reported that we saw about 3,000 more professionals leave EMS than come into it that year. That trend has continued. That is putting some very high stress on the EMS system as we see it today. We also have the issues with funding. We are currently still working in an outdated reimbursement model that does not cover the full cost of care. Over the years, we continue to see more of the population move uh, into more government payer models where they're being reimbursed by CMS or Medicaid, and those costs are below the cost of care. And so every year as we continue to see that shift, EMS becomes harder and harder to sustain. This has been something that we heard throughout the state this year as the legislative EMS task force met throughout all regions of the state. The MAA has held some roundtable discussions and meetings throughout the state as well over the last couple of years. And this funding concern has been heard loud and clear that we just don't have the money to continue to sustain. Tax dollars within communities are going up. And there's a lot of more details within that, but those workforce and funding concerns are really what are driving the issues that we're seeing today. The EMSRB is not really the primary concern that we're seeing. We are, we do recognize the OLA audit uh, brought forward, you know, multiple er uh, areas of issue and deficiency. Many of them have been uh, have been addressed, and in the most recent update from the OLA, it did recognize that there's been a lot of forward movement, but we do recognize that there's some need for some regulatory change in the industry. However, we do not see why that change cannot occur within the current EMSRB structure, and instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, why can't we continue to repair and fix what is there today? Because we already have an industry that is severely stressed, it's already facing multiple issues and concerns. And so why would we go and try to change the entire foundation of the EMSRB, which could then just bring in new issues, new concerns, that, we then, that could then distract from us being able to repair what's there today. Um, there's some parts of the recommendation that I read today that I think we could see potential in, but to completely start over new and to try to do this quickly seems a bit reckless. Our ask would be to continue to take in public comment, industry comment, continue to have the EMS regulatory uh, task force meet and, and try to really review how this could be a win for the system as a whole and so that we can really move things forward. Um, yeah, I think I will, that will conclude my time. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Fox, oh, thanks. Are we have, okay. We're having internet issues, I guess, or connectivity issues. What are we? Well, she just lost it too. I think get out of the storm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess uh, we'll have to watch um, if we are having connectivity issues to make sure that we get our the members back online. But um, Mr. Fox, if you could proceed with your testimony. Hello, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, my name is John Fox. I'm a paramedic that's worked predominantly rural throughout my somewhat 20 plus 30 year career. Um, I'm currently um, working at a small community service in Dodge Center, uh, Minnesota. Um, we are um, uh, very fortunate. We have had a great culture. We've got great leadership. We have an incredible team of great BLS volunteer providers. We would not be able to do what we do without our great EMTs that come in and donate their time. But the longstanding issue and the things that I'm here to talk about is, as it is right now, the EMSRB isn't the prime focus in rural. It is the funding to try and make sure our workforce and other issues keep getting addressed. Um, there was some pretty good financial data that came out recently on about that $50 million worth of donated labor that has been masking this problem for years. We can talk about Medicare, Medicaid, all those other things, but this is the stuff I deal with and have dealt with most of my career. 
What we need right now and what I would like to see is not this, I think Michael said it too, is the distraction. Certainly, we're, it, it, things can change. I love the idea, the attention we've been getting. But what we need right now is we are in crisis. We have services that are about ready to fall. I mean, literally, and I know that that's what drove some of this stuff going out there. Uh, Wednesday, so yeah, Tuesday, Thursday, yesterday, we were actually covering both our neighboring services because they were not able to staff. And we aren't much different than they are. And that's all throughout the state. We are ready to go. And if we don't get the funding, we have some other issues, that's where we need to be looking at. Other things that we can talk about too, and I, I, I love the innovation idea. I love that idea of some maybe some more uh, tiered response. But I'm not a very popular paramedic because I would say that BLS, EMTs, are the foundation of what we do. They can do most of what we're at. Even one of the big conferences last year, FDIC, the medical directors recognized that the only reason we have paramedics on every truck or tried to do that is it was financial because we could bill more for it. If we let EMTs be EMTs and we expect them to be EMTs, we got some really good care out there and we supplement it with a few medics in the chase car model is an awesome idea. But what we need right now, and I'm just gonna spin right back down to it, is not the distraction, but we need to work on the workforce and the funding for my rural folks that are out there. They're doing great work, but they just need some help. That's us that I have, so thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to call up um, Buck McAlpin and Mark Contarato. Come up to the table. Welcome to we'll the Mark go, or Dr. Conorado go first okay. if we could, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Conorado. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for letting me testify today. I am Dr. Mark Conorado, and I've been a practicing emergency medicine physician and EMS medical director in Minnesota for over 30 years. In addition, I'm one of the founding members of the Minnesota chapter of the National Association of uh, Emergency Medicine, Physi uh, um, National Emergency Medical School Services Physicians. I'm currently the director of medical director for Plymouth Fire Rescue, but today I'm also representing my outstate EMS medical director partners. We collectively provide local medical direction and supervision through a nonprofit organization for over 110 medical services encompassing 32 Minnesota counties with a cumulative experience of over 100 years in this field. The Minnesota EMSRB was developed through the collaborative efforts of physicians and other EMS-oriented organi uh, uh, organizations and individuals in the early 1990s. It was developed to provide a unified ent entity for medical regulation, but also for encouraging medical director input in the ongoing development and functioning of emergency medical services in Minnesota. This was a monumental accomplishment at the time and was looked upon by many other states as a goal many of them hoped to achieve. Many of the individuals who participated in this project were considered some of the leading national proponents of EMS at the time. The 2022 OLA report exposed shortcomings and problems in the office, but as organizations grow and evolve, changes may have to occur. The EMSRB has made significant progress and improvement in rectifying the deficiencies noted in the OLA report. My partners and I uh, feel that this office is now functioning at an extremely high level. To abruptly change this office from an entity that has collaborative function with EMS professionals and medical directors throughout the state without a well thought out strategy and plan will cause significant harm. The current bill provides for a non-integrated advisory board who are relegated only to minor functions. The conditions of EMS in this Minnesota is a rapidly changing state. This has been stated by many other people. We're seeing the closure of rural hospitals, which causes EMS services to take on a more emergent load of caring for the public. In addition, many local EMS services are not only experiencing financial stress, but also the problem of finding enough trained personnel who in the outstate are mainly volunteers. Over 70% of these services are provided by local entities in the outstate, with a majority of these being BLS and first responder services. We feel that the need for regulatory oversight combined with strong medical direction input, cooperation and assistance has never been greater. In conclusion, 
My partners and I feel that the establishment of an appointed EMS commissioner to replace the director and board of the EMSRB would be a step backward in the development of and growth of EMS in the state of Minnesota. The interaction and cooperation in, uh, between the EMSRB director and the integrated EMSRB advisory bo uh, board are crucial to the ongoing health and development of EMS in the state of Minnesota. The proposed sent file motion and amendment does not address the issues that have been identified by the OLA report. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McAlpin. Yeah, Madam Chair, members, Buck McAlpin. I'm here with two groups today, the Minnesota Ambulance Association, many of them, have, a lot of them behind me here today, and the Minnesota Academy and chapter of a, the Emergency Physicians Group, which is about 725 emergency physicians statewide. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll thank Senator Seberger. If we can ever bring this much attention to EMS, we appreciate it. And she's been very open to conversations, and we do appreciate that. But I'm just going to step back a little bit from the other testifiers. I'm probably one of the old gray hairs of this group. Uh, 42 years I've been in EMS. I started as an EMT and a paramedic at North Memorial in 1983. And uh, I was one of the ones around when we formed the initial EMS regulatory board. And to Dr. Contarato's points, that was uh, seasoned veterans like Dr. Francione, Dr. Lilger from North, Bob Long from Hennepin County, uh, and some EMS professionals around the state that said, you know, we kind of should come out of the Department of Health and as EMS grows, have more visibility. Has there been ups and downs since 1995, since the board started? Absolutely. But some of the recent changes the last couple of years, and I think to everyone's point about and why you're hearing opposition to this, some of these proposals, is that uh, I always say there was two years of legislative work done in 94, 95, uh, with many advocacy groups. And I'm sure uh, Senator Seberger will hear from other advocacy groups that would come out of this model that really were, are involved today, sheriffs, nurses, public safety, public health, and how we're a cohesive healthcare delivery model in the state. Uh, everyone's point, the funding issue is the big issue. Uh, large health care systems are a big part of this, but they're struggling too financially to support it. But I think as we look the next, uh, you know, if this gets done this session, we understand we want to be in the conversation. We think it's a longer conversation. And if we look back to the OLA audit, that's been probably two, two and a half years now. Uh, what even happened before the audit was completed, uh, some members behind me today, the chairs and vice chairs of the board, worked with the state administration, uh, administrative side to change the hiring practice. Because what happened for 20 plus years in the regulatory board, uh, when you applied, you literally had to have a master's degree or be an attorney to be our regulatory board executive director. Uh, Chair Guyton at the time and Vice Chair Miller worked really hard to change that so we could go out and hire, surprisingly, a paramedic, with an emergency services background and a fire background. That's Executive Director Ferguson today. Where the board has came the last two years, uh, if Senator Seberger had this bill four years ago, we'd probably be sitting up here in a whole different conversation. That's not the case today as we look at EMS. And uh, as the system continues to fracture around the state financially, we would really like to turn our focus to things like our community paramedic, community EMT, the chase car the senator just established, supplemental payments, uh, Senator Hoffman and Senator Abler, non-emergency transportation. That's all being loaded onto the ambulance departments because we're not funding that appropriately. You worked on that last year. And there's lots of legislation increasing Medicaid payments with federal match. There's things that we can do that really impact our infrastructure. But right now, to throw this into the mix of the conversation, uh, we'll continue to work with the senator. But uh, we want to be sure that this isn't the priority, and this is probably a longer conversation than trying to complete this in a few weeks in a short session. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments for Sen Senator Utke? Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, we've heard a lot of good things, so I don't want to repeat a, much of it, but I will touch on a few things. Um, the, the overwhelming thing we've heard over and over again is funding. I think we had a good discussion on that yesterday, too, with a lot of things where the lack of funding or the less than covering the cost of services funding, which yesterday a big deal was the uh, behavioral health 
Um, they're upside down, losing providers, closing um, providers' establishments because the funding is too low. We're hearing the same thing. We've heard it in many other instances. This, this problem is just snowballing, goes it's one after the other. Um, without funding, you're, you're helpless because you rely on us uh, or the state. Um, so uh, the, that's the, the, big, the big issue we're hearing, and it's very realistic. Um, and so this bill is uh, doing nothing to help that, that's for sure. I hear the fact that it's a distraction and a step backwards. I fully believe that, too. I've watched what's taken place the last number of years since we got that o OLA report and the, the things that have taken place since then, and uh, the people that have been working on it um, have been doing a good job. It was just, it needed a lot of work, but it is moving the ball forward. Um, we need to let this play out. Um, when I look at this thing, and I made a few notes on the bill last night, and it's like, yeah, we're throwing everything away. We're going to start over from scratch. Uh, and that led me to the last thing when the fiscal note that uh, happens to be in our packet today, um, <laughs> I would have extreme concerns over that when we talk about $1,000 or $2,000 when we're totally rebuilding um, an organization. I don't know how that could come up with such a low number. Um, this thing needs a lot of work. I hope that, uh, I don't know what the, the future of this bill is here today, but if we can send it back to the committee or uh, wherever it's got to go, but uh, this should not go forward. Let's work it out. Um, I have not had one person working with in the different provider groups, anybody associated with uh, ambulances and EMTs that has been in favor of this, it's come forward. So um, that's usually a telling story. Uh, we usually try to have agreements before we move bills forward, and I don't see it here. So thank you. Senator Seberg, any, any thoughts? Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Utke, two issues that you raised. Funding, you're absolutely correct. This bill does nothing to address funding, and it's not intended to. Funding is a significant issue, and that is something that the task force continues to examine and work on and develop uh, ideas to address. We do have ideas. We're simply not ready to move them forward yet. Um, ideas include uh, finding a revenue source, increasing uh, uh, funding for the runs that are paid for, uh, getting funding for uh, runs that don't involve transport, making uh, a more robust community paramedic system so that we can address patients more upstream so they're not relying on EMS and the emergency departments as safety net. We have a lot of ideas. There's a lot of things we're working on that will address that funding piece. That's not the topic of this bill, and that's not what we're prepared to move on yet. Um, my test the testifiers here, Senator Utke, you've been dancing around this funding issue. There's another bill out there. And the Minnesota Ambulance Association has been uh, raising a number this session of $120 million that they're asking for to, uh, for emergency ambulance aid. And the bill author knows this, and I oppose that request for a number of reasons. Number one, the idea is that these ambulances uh, and entities have been in financial trouble for years and years and years, and we need this aid to stop the bleeding and, and give them emergency uh, support. They didn't come to us last year when we had the money. Last year, we passed a $300 million public safety aid with designated funds to every city, tribal nation, and townships, and county in the state. And very little of that money trickled down to EMS. There's a police agency up on the range that used that money to buy canoes to attract new hires to its police department. And they are now at the table asking for part of this $120 million. So yes, funding is an issue. But this isn't the way to do it. The other problem I have with that is that Bill asked for this amazing amount of money to be paid into the EMSRB, which we already know doesn't function properly. And there's no mechanism for who qualifies for this, how it's paid out, who makes the determination. It's not a responsible bill, in my opinion, and it's not a responsible ask. So yes, funding is an issue. 
and we recognize that on the task force, and it is something that we need to address desperately. But that's not the topic of this bill. This bill addresses the governmental structure of EMS, and we're not scrapping it and building it from scratch. We're not starting over. We're taking what already exists and reorganizing it. That's why there's very little fiscal impact, because what exists can absorb that change already. We're restructuring. We're not starting over. And this isn't something that just came out of the air two weeks ago. It's not something that um, my counterpart and I dreamed up last week trying to cram through in a short session. This has been in the works for years. And the stakeholders here know that. And I've been dealing with and, and conversing with and bouncing ideas off of um, all the stakeholders here. And I've gotten some really good ideas. But what you're not seeing is um, the people that are, you've heard from are in the ambulance industry um, and generally those that have been represented on the EMSRB already. You haven't heard from the fire folks. You haven't heard from labor. You haven't heard from the, uh, a lot of the regional members of different parts of Minnesota and all folks that we now want to include and have a voice in emergency medical services. So we're taking the structure and we're making it better and we're including more voices. That's what we're doing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Atke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just uh, comment. I, I don't read it and see it the same way, but um, the fact is I have heard from people across the state that are involved and the response has been the same. Um, they don't like it. So I'm just re telling you what I'm hearing. I haven't had one person come forward yet and said, please pass this because it's, it's a move in the right direction. Everybody said the opposite. So, um, you know, and I don't get the chance to talk to everybody, but I have had a good sampling across the state. So I'm just relaying that, that uh, I think this needs a lot more conversation before we do something as drastic as this. So thank you. Um, any other members have any questions or comments? Uh, we are in the process of <clears throat> trying to get our internet connection back. So I'm just kind of, we're, Oh, okay, so Senator Kupek may wish to speak. Oh, now we're back online. Senator Kupek, can you um, hear and did you want to ask a question or make a comment? Sure, I, I, I would you. love to make a comment because I was also uh, you know, part of this uh, commission with Senator Seabroker. I will tell you, I don't know what your internet problem is out there, but it's all been coming through loud and clear on this end. So I've heard everything. So it's been uh, really good and I'm, and I'm glad uh, we're having this discussion and moving it forward. And yes, the funding is is you know the the critical mass here. Uh, but certainly, also we're you know hoping that our federal friends uh, could also step up and and do something on this. I know our you know our delegation in Washington is also working on this because if they could increase those Medicare Medicaid reimbursement rates for ambulances, uh, a lot of the financial problem would obviously go away. But there has been. You know, in the past, uh, problems uh, with the, the structural uh, part of this board. And I think, you know, kind of elevating this up and getting, you know, it more to like almost want to call it a, a cabinet level or, you know, getting in, in a commissioner who will oversee this, uh, I think, will be a step kind of in the right direction uh, for, you know, moving forward and making sure we don't have those problems and sorting things out uh, moving ahead. We haven't really done a lot of changes. Uh, to the way ambulances are overseen and structured really since the 1980s. Um, so it is probably time for a little bit of updating. And I will also say adding uh, this sprint car model that was added in the amendment there uh, is an excellent, excellent choice. That I think around also some areas of telehealth uh, will also be able to alleviate you know, some of those problems, if particularly in the rural areas uh, with some of the runs that are maybe not necessary for ambulances to go out and we can help that and, and lower that because that is also something you know we heard a lot of in these commission meetings about the the headaches of you know basically becoming you know an ambulance uber for runs that they're not needed so i think that will also help in that direction so i uh, thank senator seaberger for her work on this thank you um members any other questions or comments 
uh, I guess seeing none, um, this bill needs to move to the state government committee, and I think then they have um, discussion about the structure and um, that that aspect. Um, Senator Seberg, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm grateful to be able to have the opportunity to have these discussions. Um, and what you've heard from a lot of people in this conversation is it's long past time to have these conversations. One of the, the biggest takeaways I took during the task force meeting was that people were hungry to talk about this. We haven't had the opportunity to have these discussions. And um, it's been gratifying, I think, for all of us to finally be able to dig into some of these issues and try to make EMS better in the state of Minnesota. So I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, and, and yes, I would, I'd like to say thank you for all of your work. Um, you and the, the co-chair did an extensive amount of work during the interim and in organizing and um, conducting the, the visits around the state to get input. Um, I know that you've been working diligently on this um, all the time that you've been in the Senate now, so I really appreciate your, um, your focus on this. And I, I think this bill, um, I think that we, we need to keep this discussion going and, and it seems like a more, um, this type of structural change will bring more strength to our emergency services um, in the state. So um, members, anything else, any other comments? If not, um, Senator Morrison moves that Senate file uh, 4835 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on State Government. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion does prevail. Senate file 4835 as amended is passed and referred to the Committee on State Government. Thank you. And then we have um, Senate file 4697. Oh, that's right. I got two. You get to stay. <laughs> I forgot. And thank you. I was wondering why no one was moving. Senator Seberger. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I also have Senate File 4697, uh, which is a staffing bill. So part of the discussion you just heard us talk about was staffing challenges. And as you know, there's workforce shortages all over the state, in every industry, and in fact, all over the country. And EMS is no different. Um, particularly in greater Minnesota, uh, our ambulances have a tremendous amount of difficulty maintaining adequate staffing requirements. This bill would allow for additional flexibility to ensure that uh, we have a qualified EMS clinician in the back with a patient, but not necessarily an EMS cl clinician driving the rig. Um, the ambulance would be driven by um, an emergency responder, somebody with some emergency medical training and obviously emergency vehicle operation training. I'm thinking like a firefighter or other first responder on the scene. But that would free up the EMT to be in back, provide patient care, and get folks where they needed to go. Um, the idea here is to add some flexibility into staffing requirements so that we ease the burden a little bit and make it easier for our ambulances to be staffed and qualified personnel to be where they need to be, which is in the back with the patient. Um, I don't have any testifiers. I don't know if anybody was lined up ready um, to testify. I don't have anybody signed up. Okay. Mr. McAlpin, did you wish to testify on this Oh, yeah, Mad uh, Madam Chair, members, Buck McAlpin Ambulance Association. This is a great bill Senator Seberger has today. and. Uh, Actually, some of the language in this bill is some stuff that we had during the COVID pandemic. And as we continue to face what we call a crisis, and especially rural Minnesota, that this driver type position that's allowed uh, working through the regulatory board has been very effective to be sure, at least to the senator's point, there's a paramedic or EMT in the back and we're getting the ambulance out to do runs. So. Thank you. Uh, members, do you have any questions or comments about this bill? Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Seberger. Um, my daughter uh, proudly recently became an EMT, uh, and she I was really surprised at how difficult it was for her to get a job, <laughs> given the, uh, that we need EMTs. Um, I'm wondering if there's, is anyone opposed to this bill? Senator Seberger. 
Madam Chair, Senator Morrison, I have not heard one word in opposition. Great, glad to hear that, Senator, Senator Seberger, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for bringing this forward. Any other questions? Um, seeing none, this bill actually um, doesn't need to move to another committee, so we will um, <laughs> we will uh, Senate File 4697 is laid over for possible inclusion in an ominous bill. Thank you, Senator Sieber. And now. Sen Senator Hoffman, we are going to go to your bill now. Senator McEwen isn't present yet, so um, Senate File 4010. Sorry, Madam Chair, I was so busy looking at those fiscal notes that like all 10 of them when they were at zero, 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 and I threw them over at Senator Atkin. I said, this is the kind of fiscal notes you like to see. And then he was like, we were, that's what I was doing. So I, I appreciate you, Madam Chair. Yeah, no, that's okay. We just, we needed to figure out where, where to go next on the agenda, so. Senate Sen File 4010, right? Yep. So Madam Chair and members, imagine the unthinkable. While you're vacationing in France, your loved one experiences a medical emergency and passes away, and that's happened. And, and, and I'm telling you an anecdotal true story. In addition to the heartache and grief that a family has experienced, um, now there's a daunting task of arranging for transportation of your loved one back to Minnesota. According to the U.S. Embassy website, there's an estimate to cost and ship uh, your loved one back can be anywhere between $7,000 on the East Coast to $7,200 to the Midwest and $7,400 to the West Coast. Travel protection agreements, uh, which are sold by funeral directors, can protect consumers from the high cost of transportation for around $500 paid in advance. Consumers uh, can have their loved one transported from anywhere in the world back uh, outside if they out if they pass outside a 75 mile radius of your home what this bill does uh, members uh, madam chair is it clarifies that these travel protection products which can be sold separately from the usual funeral service such as caskets and flowers are not considered pre-need services so i'd like to turn this over to kathy layman keho who's with dignity memorial uh, is here to testify, and then John Reich is here um, on behalf of SCI if you have any questions about any technicalities of the bill. Madam Thank you. Chair, um, welcome to the committee. Please Thank state you. your name for the record and begin your testimony. Um, my name is Kathy Lehman Cahoe, and I am with Dignity Memorial, and I've been a licensed Minnesota funeral director for 40 years. I'm here today to support the Senate File 4010. This bill would clarify that travel protection agreements are not considered pre-need services under Minnesota law. Travel protection agreements are sold by funeral directors to consumers for a fee of around $500. A deceased would be transported back to their community if they die more than 75 miles away from their home. Pre-need services are those services and items such as caskets, burial plots, flowers, etc., that consumers purchase in advance of their death, therefore earning the name pre-need. When consumers purchase a pre-need package, it costs tens of thousands of dollars. As a result, there is strict consumer protection put on funeral directors as to how that money is paid in advance is handled. Funeral directors must provide disclosures, put the funds into a trust, and report annually to the Minnesota Department of Health as to the details of the funds. Consumers can purchase travel protection outside of that pre-need service and merchandise package. If travel protection agreements are considered the same as pre-need in the future, then the funeral director is subject to all of those same regulations of pre-need services and merchandise, and that just doesn't make sense. Travel protection takes effect immediately and has proven to provide peace of mind and cost-effective protection to those who want the freedom to travel. We're concerned that leaving it as is may have a chilling effect on the ability to provide these services in the future. 
I personally have purchased travel protection for my parents, my husband, and myself, and we travel a fair amount. And a one-time fee that we're now covered for life um, is giving us peace of mind. My parents in their 70s were driving to Winnipeg multiple times a year, and it made me comfortable with them doing that because we knew they had this protection. It really was that peace of mind. We've served many families who have had travel protection and in, in place at the time of a death of a loved one um, where we were able to provide that service to them and bring their loved one home without additional exorbitant expense. They were grateful and they really felt blessed that everything was taken care of to bring their loved one home. Thank you. Um, Mr. Reich, uh, what's up? Oh, he's just for questions, okay. Yep. Um, Senator Hoffman, any other comments? Uh, no, Madam Chair, I mean, unless you wanna get JR down here and you can quiz him for the next hour and a half, that would be fine, we'll <laughs> see if he's prepared. No, that's I'm good. Okay. You're going to lay this over, right? No, this actually needs to go to the Commerce Committee. So I'm grateful it's not going to judiciary. That's all yes. I can say there. So right. I'll move. I'll move Do, then. Um, let me just ask if any member has any questions. I don't know. Are we? Are our members online available? <laughs> okay. Oh, Senator Kupek. Or, Senator Kupek, did you have a question? Uh, just a just a comment, Madam Chair. This is this is a really good bill. We just dealt with this uh, in my family. Actually, I had to move somebody from was within the United States. Uh, it was a bill was about seven thousand dollars. So uh, thanks, Senator Hoffman, for bringing this. Thank you. Seeing, I don't see any of their questions, Senator Hoffman. Um, yeah, can... Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I can. And if if we can get the. The chair to, to waive Senate File 4010, then it would stay as it would be laid over then to you. Is that is that correct? Um, well, I yeah, I can't. I don't know if I can do that today, but you could. We can we can send it to Commerce, and then if you talk to Senator Klein and he he chooses not, you know, he doesn't need to hear it. We can have it referred back. Oh, that's fine. That's, that's good. I'm just I'm just looking at you know this. 120 constituent days, and it's yeah, now we're down to like four, and yeah. so it's like I just wanted to see where we at in the timeline. But no, that's fine. I, I okay. moved Senate File 4010 um, be re referred to the uh, Committee on Commerce. Thank you. Members, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The uh, Senate File 4010 is passed and referred to the Committee on Commerce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. And next you have Senate File 4330. That's correct, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I, I, not that, you know, I, I, usually there would be some reference to some hockey team because, you know, you have Senator Kupek in this beautiful dining room in Moorhead, Minnesota. Uh, but, but Senator Kupek, did you know, and Madam Chair, there's a random fact right now today on this day March 15th 1985 those of us that were around in 1985 the very first dot com domain was registered did you guys know that it was symbolics.com why did I bring that up well, it was somewhat fitting since a dot com most of us use quite often Amazon.com is here with me today to testify on behalf of this bill, Madam Chair. And so, Madam Chair and members, what this bill simply does is change the definition of usual and customary price to exempt any program a pharmacy utilizes from the usual and customary price definition where they charge a fee up front in order to lower the price of prescriptions for their customers. Now, without this change, any pharmacy utilizing such a program uh, would then put their reimbursement at risk for every drug in their fee program, regardless if it's purchased through the fee program or not. What I'm asking for is the proposed language in Senate File 4330 seeks to make clear that the fee programs like the one you're gonna hear about shortly from Amazon Pharmacy can operate in a state without impacting, 
without impacting reimbursement rates for their pharmacy business occurring outside of such programs. So, Madam Chair and members, um, we have testimony that's submitted from the Minnesota retailers. It's in your packet in support of Senate File 4330, and that should be in front of you. And then I have a representative, representative here from Amazon Pharmacy that's going to talk about support of the bill next, and that's Patrick Tuhey. Tuhi, it's Amazon Pharmacy. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Patrick Tuhi, and I'm testifying on behalf of Amazon Pharmacy in support of Senate File 4330. Now, being born and raised in the north suburbs of these Twin Cities, I'm very excited to be back in my home state testifying this simple but very important bill. So for those who don't know, Amazon Pharmacy is a full-service digital pharmacy in your pocket. So we dispense, like any other pharmacy, most medications prescribed by your doctor's office, but we deliver them to your door fast and free. Now our team of pharmacists are available 24-7 for any clinical questions, concerns, or thoughts you may have with any professional pharmacist. So we accept most insurance plans and we offer some subscription savings such as Prime. Uh, we have auto-applying coupons for some new products, and then the, in many states, RX Pass is a program that I'm here to talk about today. Senate File 4330 does clarify subscription-based if the patient pays to be exempt from the usual and customary price of the Minnesota statute. This change allows Minnesotans to benefit from any pharmacy program that increases access to medications at a dramatically lower price point. So our example of RX Pass. RX Pass is a service available to Prime members and when I say Prime, I mean Amazon Prime members, that allow them to obtain more than 50 plus generic medications treating over 80 common ailments. Uh, and this is a subscription-based program at only $5 a month. So if you are an Amazon Prime member and you spend more than $5 a month on your generic medications and they're on this list, RxPass could help you save money. So on average, we're seeing about $20 per month for average savings um, on customers that utilize this program in obviously other states. RX Pass is not insurance and it's not a substitute for insurance. So it, it's, help for those, it's helpful to those who are under and uninsured, but again, it is not an insurance product. If Senate File 4330 passes, we're really hoping forward and looking forward to being able to launch RX Pass as quickly as we can in the state of Minnesota. So again, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for your time today. Thank you. Uh, any other thoughts? Any questions, Senator Bolden, or online? Don't see any hands raised. Um, Go to the floor. And if you could tell us, I don't know, maybe you mentioned, so other states have implement, implemented this already? Yes, ma'am. Uh, pardon me. Yes, Chair. Um, RX Pass is live in 45 states currently. Um, Minnesota is not one of those states. So in many states, it, we've worked with the regulator, regulating body or the legislative, if need be, to make sure that they understood this program wasn't um, just a sign up for everybody. It's not a generic population. It's a two-tier subscription service. OK. Thank you. And I don't see any other hands raised. Um, Senator Hoffman, any final thoughts? We're going to be laying this bill over. So. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I do have an update after uh, we uh, lay this one over, but I appreciate your time on this, and thank you. Okay. Don't forget, it's dot .com this day, 1985. Yeah, interesting trivia today. <laughs> thank you, Senator Hoffman. Senate file uh, 4330 is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, may I? Senator Klein has said he does not need to hear Senate file 4010. Okay, well, I think we already. You can figure this out. I mean, I just stopped an extra stop. At least it's not going to judiciary, Madam Chair. I mean, that's half the thing. So. Senator Hoffman. Um, Let's see, we will move to reconsider uh, the motion on Senate file uh, 4010. Uh, 
All those in favor of supporting the motion to reconsider, please signify by saying aye. Is that aye. correct? Aye. aye. Uh, any opposed? The motion does prevail. Um, I believe the bill is back before us then. Um, and now, Senator um, Hoffman, um, we will um, lay over Senate File 4010 for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Madam Chair and members, thank you. You're welcome. And now we are going to need to recess for about 10 minutes. Um, we are waiting for Senator McEwen to be able to join us. So uh, we are in recess.
Committee, uh, Health and Human Services Committee is now reconvened. Uh, and now we have Senator McEwen is online and Senator McEwen has Senate file 4074. Welcome to the committee, Senator McEwen, if you'd uh, please proceed and uh, present your bill. Oh, no. oh dear. So can you hear me have, okay? Yes, we, we can. We are um, struggling a bit with internet issues and we'll, we'll cross our fingers that it won't happen while you're testifying or while you're presenting your bill. But um, I guess I should ask you first, um, I know, let's see, the amendments are, are ones that somebody else is bringing forward. Is that? Oh, yeah, they're not my amendments. You don't have any. Okay. So why don't you go ahead and present your bill? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Members, I appreciate, I appreciate very much you making time to hear this bill today. Senate File 4074 provides necessary technical amendments to Minnesota statutes governing permitting of groundwater thermal exchange devices. Groundwater thermal exchange devices, including aquifer thermal energy storage technology, have the potential to provide the benefits of geothermal energy in urban and other high density locations where it might, uh, might not otherwise be available because of the lack of space to deploy traditional geothermal technology. The technology components are the same and the permitting and regulation are similar to what is already allowed under state statute. Projects proposing this non-consumptive use of the water contained in Minnesota's aquifers to extract thermal energy provide an additional tool to decarbonize the hard to de decarbonize area of the state new and existing building stock. Uh, the current language and statute has a very low gallons per minute threshold for large projects. This low threshold prohibits application of this technology to anything beyond the size of a small residence. So Senate file 3074 in no way changes the obligation of owners, developers, and operators of these systems to operate in a manner that is consistent with current state regulations and rules. Compliance with the current rules and regulations will allow for the safe utilization of the aquifers um, as an energy resource for the state while complying with existing water use rules and requirements found in Chapter 103G. There are two projects in the metropolitan region in particular at various stages of development that offer the chance to decarbonize two high profile redevelopment projects um, that propose thousands of square feet of new buildings utilizing an aquifer thermal energy storage systems. The projects are located at 2800 East Lake Street in Minneapolis and the Heights located on the Upper East Side of St. Paul at the former Hillcrest Golf Course location. In addition, this technology is also a key feature of Mayo Clinic's transformative energy delivery project in Rochester. Two new clinical buildings totaling nearly 2 million square feet of space will combine innovative care concepts and digital technologies in a physical space like uh, in a physical space. These projects will miss out on the opportunity to connect to this renewable energy resource if this file is not passed during the session. Uh, Madam Chair, members with me today, I have a testifier, Michael Auger from Evergreen Energy, who can elaborate on why this uh, Senate file is necessary to facilitate uh, realizing these opportunities. Great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Auger, if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Michael Auger, and I am Senior Vice President and Chief Business Officer of District Energy St. Paul and Evergreen Energy. Based in St. Paul, Evergreen Energy develops, operates, manages, and maintains district energy systems across the United States. I'm here to speak in support of Senate File 4074. Since 2018, Evergreen has been working on deploying aquifer thermal energy storage as a potential energy source for district energy systems in Minnesota. During that time, Evergreen engaged collaboratively with the Minnesota Department of Health to discuss permitting these projects, along with permitting test wells needed for project due diligence. In late 2023, on the cusp of test well drilling in Minneapolis for the 2800 East Lake Street project, Evergreen was informed by the department that upon additional review and guidance, it was apparent that these types of projects proposed in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Rochester were not permittable under the current state statute. Through further discussion, 
with the department, it became apparent that amending the state statute to allow for a larger gallons per minute flow rate would be acceptable given that aquifer thermal energy storage projects do not consume water. In other words, this is a not consumptive use, uh, as Senator McEwen indicated. Um, along with the current rules and regulation that are in place to already ensure that the projects would be deployed in a manner that protected the state's natural resources, including those contained in Chapter 103G by way of reference. As mentioned in Senator McEwen's introduction, there are currently three projects under development in the state that are at a critical moment where permit clarity is needed now in order to successfully deploy aquifer thermal energy storage systems. The 2800 East Lake Street project in Minneapolis, the Heights project in St. Paul and the former Hillcrest Golf Course, and the project under development at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. All three projects are able to deliver carbon-free heating and cooling energy to redevelopment projects that will include low-income and affordable housing, commercial, retail, and light industrial space, and health care. Put simply, if Senate File 4774 does not move forward, it is likely that a majority of these buildings will have to resort to using natural gas for heating and other less efficient means for cooling. Finally, this technology has been widely deployed safely and effectively around the world. It has been utilized in Europe for over 20 years, and there are in fact over 2,500 of these systems in the Netherlands alone. Recognizing the great potential of these systems in the United States, the Department of Energy has made investments over the last several years in order to advance their commercialization and deployment. We thank the department for its commitment to collaboration that has led us to this point. They have been a good partner and have been very responsive to our questions. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 4074, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. And I also have on the list Jack Roll. Is that, uh, yes. if you could please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Jack Roll. I'm a facility project manager with Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I'm here, like Mike, today to share our support of Senate File 4074. First, I would like to thank, thank Senator McEwen for authoring this important legislation and for the partnership of our colleagues at Evergreen Energy. Second, I'd like to briefly share why Mayo Clinic intends to use this technology in our Bolt Forward Unbound in Rochester project. As we embark on the Unbound project, a project to build nearly 2 million square feet of space that will be used to deliver the most advanced health care to our patients at our Rochester campus, we want to do so in a way that both meets or exceeds the needs of our patients, yet is achieved while being good stewards of the environment. After much research, planning, and design, we believe this geothermal technology provides us with the best opportunity to not only achieve these goals, but also aligns with Mayo Clinic's commitment to the Department of Energy's Better Climate Challenge. Given the size of this project, we plan to utilize the technology to a greater extent than what is currently allowed by law, which is why we're in favor of Senate File 4074. And as Mike said, the current law uh, with this technology is a, is a single family home uh, and we're doing nearly 2 million square feet. We look forward to the opportunity to work with MDH and the DNR as we begin to implement this technology and we truly appreciate your support today. Again, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about this project and the application of the geothermal technology at Mayo Clinic. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Um, I have Bruce Clevin on the list as well as a testifier. Welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and begin. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Bruce Clavin, I represent the Minnesota Water Well Association. And I was unable to speak directly to Senator McEwen before the hearing, but I have been in touch with the proponents of our association, let them know we had one concern with the bill. And we're not here to sandbag uh, them at all in the last minute, but I want to draw the committee's attention to uh, lines 2.1 and 2.2. Uh, in fact, uh, to let the members know, we have board members who are involved, I think, if I remember this right, in the mail project. So they want to see this go forward. What they have heartburn over is the phrase, any permit conditions deemed necessary. 
And so we see that as unfettered discretion to the department. We don't know what those will be. I took the time to print for the committee the rules and the permit that the department actually has for these units. And so our members see following this as the following the law. It would be this plus whatever the department puts on. And so I talked with them out in the hallway this morning. We kind of narrowed down to what they were getting at, and I won't speak for them, they're here. But what I learned from them this morning is they want to have data points, a little bit more monitoring if we're in a contaminated area and that kind of thing. But that's not what we're saying on those lines. We're saying anything. And so between now and conference, hopefully we can reach some uh, conclusions with the department of something that would work for them in terms of data points and monitoring. But that's not what we have in front of us today. And so we would encourage the committee to delete uh, lines 2.1 and 2 and uh, with our commitment, we'll, we'll keep working with the department. Thank you. Um, so those are all the testi testifiers that we have. Um, members, do we have any comments or questions? Senator Hoffman. Madam Chair, given that and, and given the fact that they want data points and monitoring, the new language on 2.1 and 2.2 doesn't do that, it just gives that broadly any permit conditions, right? And so I, I move the A3 amendment, let's get that moved so that the, the department can come in and redo and get for the next time we get together data points and monitoring, that's the language that should be in there. Um, so um, A3 is it in front of everybody. Um, Madam, uh, yeah, Senator Hoffman, so uh, we're discussing the A3, and I, I want to make sure if um, Senator McEwen is able to see the A3, because obviously she um, needs to be able to comment on it, and if she would like to ask us to get, um, I don't know, more of a um, input from the department about what the impact is of this change. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I, I will say that I did see that these amendments were potentially going to be brought, and I did get a look at them, um, in particular the A3. Excuse me. Um, but I, I really haven't had time to um, vet what the effect of removing that language in 2.1 and 2.2 would, would have overall in the bill. Um, I'm a little bit... Um, hesitant to want to make a change like that without really knowing what the ramifications would be. Um, I, I would absolutely entertain this possibility of making this change if I have a, a better understanding and I'm able to kind of vet the language a little bit more and talk to some people about it. But I'm just, um, I would say that I'm a little bit uncomfortable just making a change on the fly like this without having had the language um, broken down for me about what this what this effect would be and why it's why this change is needed. I don't think that this was change was made in the house language and and I really want to flesh it out a little bit more. Um, but that's it. I think it would be helpful on the record to hear what MDH has to say about that. Senator Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator McEwen. Yeah, I sent that to you last night after I was looking at it. No, the house hasn't done anything. But the, the issue at hand for me is when you say any permit conditions, right? And you're only talking specifically about the one issue here. And so, I mean, I have I have a secondary one, and I sent you both of those last night. But specifically in this one, um, it, it was that any permit conditions deemed necessary. It's a pretty broad scope when it looks at on the governance side of it. And so, um, and I can have Bruce's here. He can even go a little more deeper for you on that. And, and especially when, when it really, if the department is only looking at data points and monitoring, when you say any permit conditions, that, that any is a, you know, it's kind of like yesterday our conversation about rough fish. Where did rough fish come from? Why can't we change that? Why, why, why? So this is it. So Madam Chair, maybe Bruce can go a little more deeper than me. Um, Mr. Clevin, did you, do you have any further information you can provide? Sure. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so we brought the amendment to Senator Hoffman and asked him about changing this for today. Uh, it is different. It, the House did leave it, and uh, I did sign up to testify last week and then did not because I was discussing this, this with the proponents. If we leave it the same and nothing else happens, we'll walk into conference in May, and the first motion will be to adopt identical provisions, and these will get adopted in the first motion, and it will be done. 
if we can even change one word in here, then they won't be identical going into conference. It'll give us time to work out. And so that's partly what we're getting at here this morning is to make some change. Again, any, si any permit conditions, we don't know what those are. We do know what's in the rules, and this is 47, chapter 47, 4725.1831, plus a five page permit, name, address, schematic, pounds per square inch, all this stuff is in here. This is what they follow now. Uh, the department, again, I won't speak for them, but they told me this morning, as we get these systems bigger, we don't know what we need to do in the future. So maybe we do need to amend the rules, but they don't need to know inf more information. Well, that makes perfect sense. But to place any permit condition on it is where we have heartburn. There's no sideboards to that. Thank you. Um, I believe we have someone from the Department of Health. Uh, Mr. Hogan, if you could shed some light on um, what the impact of, you know, removing that language or why the language, uh, why you believe the language should be included in the way it, it is now. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Tom Hogan. I'm the Environmental Health Division Director at the Minnesota Department of Health, where the well program uh, was within that division. So I'll just I'll just be clear. Uh, you know, the the language as written is any permit conditions deemed necessary to protect public health and safety of groundwater. So that's really what we're after there. Certainly, in our discussions with Mr. Clavin this morning, we talked about. You know, our interest uh, in this work is really focused on where there may be groundwater contamination and there are specific information data points that we would like to collect in order to really, I'll say, memorialize this activity in rules uh, so we can look to the future as we move forward uh, with this, um, this infrastructure need for climate change. Madam Chair. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's, it still doesn't, I, you know, I, I, I'm the chair of human services. It's kind of a big deal, right? And words do matter. And what you're telling me, there's still some ambiguity to the word any, right? And so I, I, I'd like to get in, in, this is a conversation I have all the time with folks at the Department of Human Services. If you don't believe me, go ask them, right? I mean, it's like, be specific is what we want to do because the person out in the field is looking at that and they're going to they're going to interpret what you say unless you're a really good micromanager. I don't know how your management style is, but if you're a really good micromanager, then they're going to do it according to your set criteria. But anytime I see the word any, that's so ambiguous. And to me, um, that's not it's just not good, it's not good policy, any. Any means not good policy. All the other stuff is in there, so maybe we strike the word any and put some, and then you guys go and figure out you know, what that sum is. I mean, I really need to have the department specifically tell. And why I say that is this. In the 245D world, you have, you have licensors all over each county. How many counties do we have in Minnesota? 87, right? And so you got 87 different interpretations of a rule that the department put out, right? And yet you have thousands of people that are getting it. And I'll guarantee you this, one county does it differently than another county when it's the same rules because they're interpreting that word differently than what it should be. And so I'm always asking the question, is this very clear about its intent, right? Not that I'm a lawyer. I know Senator McCune is a wonderful lawyer, but I'm not a lawyer. But that word intent really comes down to what does that really mean? What is the rules spelling out on that? What's the, the rules of engagement at that point? So the word any just absolutely gets me going, eh, you know, there's still some interpretation issue there. That's my point on that one, Madam Chair. So that's it. I'd like to see that go back. And if there's some discussion that's going on, at least conference committee gets something that is going to allow them to go and have a conversation so at conference committee it can be. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, Senator Hoffman, I mean, it, it does. Um, I guess, this, you know, we're going to lay this bill over today. Um, oh, you're not moving it on. Okay. No, it, it doesn't need to move on. So, I mean, there there is a possibility for continued discussion and for Senator McEwen to get, you know, further information about what the goals are of the uh, proposed change. So, I mean, we have the possibility of laying it over as it is and you can keep working on it and if we include it in an omnibus bill then you know we can we can bring in amendments at that time um, Senator McEwen do you have a do you have thoughts about how you'd like to proceed with your bill 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate very much uh, the discussion and um, people bringing forth these concerns. My intent is for this bill to address um, this particular problem that some of these developers of this very exciting um, energy possibility for our communities have just run into. It's a, it's a correction that I would like to make. I, I like the language as it is now, although I am very open to discussion going forward. I would feel more comfortable proceeding today just laying the bill over as is, but I invite um, in Mr. Clavin and, and um, Senator Hoffman and um, MDH, we can continue this discussion and I am very happy to entertain changes if we think that um, we need some more specificity um, in, in the language. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. So, so with that, it doesn't sound like it. I'm looking at the table. I know how to count. I usually count to 34 faster than anybody else, but I'm looking at the table knowing it's going to be. So I'll withdraw the A, um, the A3. Let's withdraw that. And mm -hmm. then I want to introduce the A4 amendment. Okay. Senator Hoffman brings forward or introduces the A4 amendment. Um, can you describe that, please? Absolutely. Since, since the discussion is on the word any, um, and I knew that was going to be an issue. I don't know why I knew that, but it, I, I knew that, uh, Madam Chair. And so what this does is if it looks at it, are you looking at the A4? Does the department have the A4 in front of them too? So if you look at the new language, the 1.3, the commissioner must reconsider the necessity of any condition placed on the permit, right? The commissioner must provide that permit holder an opportunity to adequately demonstrate the condition is unnecessary to protect. We're not losing out the word protect the public health and safety of the groundwater, right? But if that's the case, in, in, in the event, the commissioner must then immediately remove the applicable permit conditions upon showing that the holder is no longer necessary or unduly burdensome to the permit holder. And so I think that clarifies the word any that's been bothering me on that. But what this does is it really installing that groundwater thermal exchange devices, those permits along with the property owner, I think this clarifies it for that piece. No, actually, I know it clarifies it. So if, if uh, I would like the A4 to be taken as a friendly amendment, knowing that you're going to lay it over, then at least, at least this gives the baseline for the department to really look at. Senator McEwen, do you have um, thoughts about the A4 amendment or have any questions you'd like to pose to people here? Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Thank you, Senator Hoffman, for bringing um, this language forward. I, again, I, I actually find the language of this one to be a, a little more concerning than the other one. <laughs> I, I, I worry about the shifting of burdens and um, in the legal context of permitting that what effect that that could have if there's a shifting of the burden where um, the agency must do something in response to a showing of an undue burden. I'm not sure exactly what the undue burden would consist of. The, so if we're, I know you have issues with the, with the word any, and I understand that, and we can talk about that, but I have some issues with the with some of the language in this amendment and just concerns about the shifting of the burden. In, in several committees over the last week or two, I've had a number of situations where we have had members of the public coming before committee with all sorts of issues where our government agencies were um, supposed to protect them and the public health and their um, well-being where it didn't happen, um, either because our laws were insufficient or the rules or the interpretation of the rules. So um, I know that there's concern about yep. whether permitting will be too restrictive, but I, I've, I'm seeing a lot of concerns about whether the, our permitting rules are protective of un, enough of the public and of our public health. So I am at this point, again, um, hesitant to just adopt language like this without really understanding and in hearing from all of the different stakeholders about what the effect of that language would be. But I am open um, to being in communication with um, the chair going forward and, and to introducing amendments at a later date. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you. Senator McEwen, I'm, uh, that's why I brought the, a, the second uh, amendment was to, when it looks at adequately demonstrating the condition is unnecessary. We still kept in there, protect the public health, because that's what we're uh, deemed to do. But what, what also gets me when you have that ambiguity of any, you have an unfettered discretion when it comes to issuing um, 
permits without sideboards. And I, and I think we want to be cautious of allowing you know, an agency, no matter what or who the agency is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the size of the Department of Human Services, but it's pretty big, right? I mean, we have this conversation all the time, and it's just a conversation is what it is, right? Um, I, I don't want to have a Senate position on this, because again, I'm looking at the numbers, you, it'll be three to one, and then there's a, there's a committee position, but what I want to get is the assurance that, that uh, Senator McEwen uh, we'll work with Mr. Claiborne and, um, and the folks and the department to make sure that, that the, the issue that is in front of us, that having that unlimited, unfettered discretion is, is very well defined in that the department is assuring some of these well folks, which by the way, that the M MWWA is, is working with the Mayo Clinic on that. I mean, you, it's, it's a win-win. How do you create a win-win and, and protect water? And if anybody wants to protect clean water, that's me. I mean, I, I'll tell you that. But um, so, with that, am I going to get the assurance, Senator McEwen, that you're going to work with uh, the advocates and, and the folks at the, the table that are here today? Senator, Absolutely, Senator, Senator Hoffman. My invitation is issued. Please uh, come to my office, and we'll we'll lay it all out and figure it out. Yeah, I'll be door knocking tomorrow. So right. thank you very much. So with that, I'll withdraw the A4, and then that, with the commitment from the author that those folks will have a, a say in that. So thank you, Madam Chair and members. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Are there any other comments, um, any other questions? Did members have any other questions? Um, any final comments, Senator McEwen, before we lay the bill over? Oh, just that um, thank you very again for hearing this bill, and I'm very excited about this technology. I understand it's it's not new technology. It, it has been in use um, in other places in the world and some of our peer nations for a number of years. And this is it's uh, about time that we get on board with this and um, have another way to produce some some clean energy and um, heating options. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And in our committee, we don't get to get involved in issues like this very often. I think it's an innovative and interesting proposal, and I'm excited to see mm -hmm. um, see these projects um, move forward so that we can expand this this type of system. So, uh, with that, um, Senate File, uh, let's see, 4074 Goes to floor. Um, is laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, Senator. And with that, we have completed our agenda and meeting is adjourned.